This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources. Consistent with its running right process, Alpha is an energy company committed to being a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. We fuel progress around the world. More information at alphanr.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at vachamber.com. Virginia hospitals and health systems provide jobs. They support our economy and promote public health. Local hospitals are always open to help people with unexpected health needs. Having a stable health care network is vital. Virginia hospitals are our lifeline. I just received a letter from a student who thanked me for instilling the love of math in him. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association. Because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond. Our subject today is health care, a variety of issues on health care, and we have the chair of the Joint Commission on Health Care, Dr. Delegate John O'Bannon, and Senator George Barker, who also serves on that commission, chair of the sub subcommittee. And we appreciate the two of you being on. Let me tell our viewers, in case they haven't had the occasion to meet you, that uh, your time of service started back in 2001. Doug O'Bannon, representing a, now a portion of Henrico County. And Senator Barker started in 2008, representing portions of Alexandria, Fairfax, and Prince William. Yes. I uh, appreciate the, the two of you being on. Uh, a medical doctor, and though not a doctor, someone who has two degrees from Harvard in healthcare issues. Right. So appreciate the, the two of you helping our viewers uh, better understand some of the health care challenges that you all face as, as policymakers. Let's start with, with one and then we'll just move to a variety of issues as you would want to bring them up. But here around Capitol Square, people say COPN. Uh, when that's spelled out, people understand it's a certificate of public need. That, that issue is before the executive branch, will be before, I think, your commission, before you finish your work. Help our, help our viewers understand the, uh, you might say, the pros and the cons uh, of, that, uh, of that issue. And I'm not sure exactly where, the, where each of you stands on that. You may be on the same perspective. Well, I'll, I'll start out. Uh, <laughs> and actually, I do have a little bit of a uh, perspective on this issue. I did spend uh, 33 years uh, working for a regional health planning agency reviewing certificate of need applications. So I have a lot of experience in this field. The certificate of need law basically says that for certain types of medical services to either develop them or to expand them, one needs state approval. Uh, the rationale behind that is that it does uh, potentially provide some significant benefits to the public. Uh, one of the things that the data show is that the more capacity you have, the more utilization of services, the more that you, know, that you have costs related to that and the more that gets passed on to the public in a variety of different ways. Part of it's through taxes to pay for Medicaid and other services. Uh, part of it's through the health insurance premiums. And so it's trying to make sure that we have enough capacity, that they're in the right area, that they're pro providing ac access to care to everybody, regardless of insurance status, and that there are not excesses that lead to uh, potential uh, c concerns. Dr. Bannon? Well, I will give George credit. George worked for many years in, as a part of the whole process, and so he certainly understands it from the inside out. Uh, I kind of have a little bit of a different perspective having been in the side where we're actually taking care of people and delivering the care, and I've watched over many years. We just actually heard a great presentation on COPN and how it came about. Mm. 
and it came about for the most part after Medicare and Medicaid were enacted in the 60s and we saw government funding for health care go way up and that trajectory is still going and that's a big issue in Washington as you know. Uh, but the COPN laws were put into place to try to limit and control at the government level what the government thought was in the public's best interest for how many beds, where they were going to be, and services, uh, heart, open heart programs, uh, liver transplant programs. Uh, Thirty years, forty years later, what has happened is that the COPN laws are now used by these big health care systems to compete with each other. In other words, I think you had Chris Peace on. Chris, yes. folks in New Kent would like very much to have an emergency center there with a CAT scan machine. The Commissioner of Health is telling him he can't do that because it's not compatible with the needs of the area. Well, tell the folks in New Kent that that have to ride in the rescue squad for 30 minutes to get anywhere. Federal Trade Commission did a look at this in 08 or 09 and came away saying it's clearly anti-competitive. Uh, when we have a bill in the General Assembly, uh, you know, the folks that already have one line up over here against anybody else getting one, and the folks that want one are on the other side. So, uh, at a minimum, it's time for us to take a look at it and clearly make some changes, update it, if not phase it out, as many other states have done. South Carolina, the governor basically did away with it by executive order. Uh, didn't work because then the hospitals got together with a lawyer and went to court and it's still going on. Georgia's hmm. looking at Interesting. it. Interesting. So there's lots going on. The fact is times have changed. We now have a, a much different system. Uh, we have big, huge hospital systems that are schooled up together now, and they use the CON to compete and try to keep their competitors from getting an advantage or a leg up. There's only four hospitals in Virginia now that are not part of a bigger network. Only four? There are four left that are not yeah. affiliated with a bigger entity. So. Uh, a lot of us that have been on the side of watching this feel like it's time to do something. I think the, the majority of states have some sort of law that way, what I've seen. But from some, some say that Virginians, uh, Virginia's is one of the most strict. I guess if you say negative, you'd say restrictive. If you do a positive word, if you see it the other way, but. Um, I think th I think there are 30 some, uh, 36 states or so that still have it. So there are a lot, of, the majority of states, about you know, almost three quarters of the states, still have a certificate of need law. What they cover differs a little bit from uh, state to state. Uh, but I think, and I think part of the reason is sometimes it gets uh, characterized as, as you just did, is that one of the things that is a hallmark of Virginia's law is that we have, uh, throughout uh, a long period of time, have had a pretty consistent approach that uh, it's a level playing field. If one entity needs to get a certificate of need to do something, everybody needs to get a certificate of need mm. to do it. So we've not set up the law to be able to say that somebody that you could do something without getting a certificate of need, but I as an entity would need to get a certificate of need. And I think that's helped maintain the support for the law as well as the effectiveness uh, of, the, of the actions and the decisions there. Well, let me, let me ask the two of you this before we move to another subject. Do you, do you see some likelihood of action being considered in the 2016 session that would alter what's currently occurring in Virginia? You know, I, I think it's likely we will see some uh, legislation to, at a minimum, update it and streamline it. That was a consideration last year. There are many pieces to this. I mean, each state's different in what it regulates, but when you read through the law, the big winners are actually the health care lawyers because all wow. of this is open to uh, you know, mm -hmm. if, if Hospital A wants to put something in Hospital B's backyard, they can file a certificate of need. The other guy says no, that mm -hmm. can, they can both each complain and it goes to court. And the law actually says that the Commissioner of Health makes the final decision about what happens. And it's been interesting how that's played out. We had that happen in Fredericksburg. We had one hospital and then Another hospital system moved in, and then they gave the one that was there another satellite, so now there are three hospitals in Fredericksburg. Hmm. And uh, it's part of the way the thing works. Well, there, there clearly are, you know, health lawyers and other you know, people involved in the decisions, you know, clearly, uh, you know, do have some, you know, personal interest in this. But in reality, most of the decisions have been made by the commissioner and have not been overturned in courts. We have actually the courts in nearly every instance when a decision has been taken to court has been uh, the decision of the commissioner has been upheld. 
So there's not been a lot of legal action, partly because it's not changed the outcome in, in many situations. But there clearly is a process that you got to go through to be able to evaluate the applications and lead up to the decision that she makes. If we move on for to talk about hospitals for a moment, you mentioned that there that there's four large networks of hospitals, or not networks, but combinations. Uh, one hears that among the rural hospitals in Virginia, that many of them are really struggling. Um, and what what do you see as again as policymakers wrestling with with the issues? Uh, not having it completely in your hands, but but the governor only would act on legislation that you all would would agree from the Senate and the House to send to the governor. Is there is there any kind of relief that uh, you you see for for hospitals, or is is it as bad as hospitals would tend to say it it is? Well, <laughs> uh, clearly there are some stresses uh, that a lot of the hospitals and the healthcare systems are feeling. And particularly some of the smaller ones and some of the ones in rural areas are the ones most impacted by those factors there. Uh, when you have a small population, a small number of people that you're providing services to, you know, that does drive up, uh, you know, cost per unit of care because you still have to have staff to be able to take care of that small number of people. Uh, some of those r hospitals in rural areas are in areas where there are significant numbers of people who are uninsured. That has a big impact because they're taking care of patients mm. for whom they get little, if any, reimbursement. And so I think it's important for us to be able to do things to try to protect those hospitals as best we can. Uh, and, and, and we have had one hospital that's closed in Virginia, but we've not uh, in a rural area in Lee County a couple of years ago, but we've not had others that have followed suit uh, recently. So I think right now we're in a position to be able to strengthen the hospitals that are already there and keep them providing services in some of those rural areas that otherwise would have some problems. So it's a, it's a, a fairly complex situation, but most of the hospitals and hospital systems in Virginia are not hurting. Just go to the front lobbies, look at the nice facilities that they have. Uh, and, and there are very dominant players. You know, you've got Centera and Riverside and Hampton Roads. You've got Anova in Northern Virginia, which just bought the Exxon Mobil campus, an old business headquarters. Uh, Anova had about a billion dollars in their foundation last time we looked at their numbers. So uh, they're thriving. There's a lot of consolidation. One of the results of Obamacare has been this rush to consolidation mm -hmm. of both the hospitals and now we see the insurance companies. And so that's your big 50,000 foot fight between who's going to have the uh, market force power to compete uh, for delivering health care going forward. Uh, the truly stressed areas are the rural areas in Southside Virginia and Southwest Virginia, where they are uh, they have a proportion of low-income folks, and they haven't been able to school up or affiliate with somebody who can bring them the uh, levels of force that uh, an ANOVA or say an HCA has, where they can bring accountants and help uh, on the clinical side. Uh, the other challenge we have is we have uh, for-profit and not-for-profit. Uh, I don't really know many not-for-profit systems that are not-for-profit. <laughs> I think they all, they all uh, have goals to, uh, you know, make money. They all have obligations to do charity care, and that's part of the CON debate is how we assure that each system. You know, the not-for-profits actually have a responsibility to uh, provide something of added value to their community for that not-for-profit status. And so that's also something that's sort of uh, getting a traction in other states, is what, what do hospital systems and hospitals bring in, in, to their communities uh, to get that tax-free benefit that the tax-paying entities, you know, they pay taxes. Uh, so those are all some of the big picture issues that I think you see as we kind of dive into this next go-round of CON and healthcare funding. and. We all want hospitals to do well and thrive, and, and they're wonderful places. They do a lot of good work, uh, but there are some concerns about getting too big and uh, anti-competitive issues when you get into markets where you're a dominant force in a market. And when you mention rural hospitals, uh, you all know, and, and any viewers who live in rural areas know that the hospital may still be there, the building's there, but they don't have as many specialists there there now in many instances and so they can see people on an emergency basis and then 
transfer them 100 miles or whatever to, to a larger facility uh, as a result of, I guess, some of the stresses that those rural ones are under. Yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly the case. Uh, you know, there, clearly there are limitations, and part of it is that, you know, a specialist is not going to go there unless there's the volume of patients to be able to be, you know, be able to provide, right. you know, support to practice there. So there are some challenges. One of the things that has happened uh, that Delegate O'Bannon talked about is that many of those rural hospitals now are sort of being picked up by VCU right. or UVA or some of the major systems. Uh, so that there is a base of care provided in the mm -hmm. hospital in a more rural area, but then there are referrals to the, in effect, the parent hospitals or the larger facility that they're affiliated with uh, for some of the specialty care. Uh, sometimes the specialists will come to the, to the community hospital. Uh, other times it's the patients referred when they need specialty care to the, uh, uh, to the large hospital in Charlottesville or Richmond or wherever. Uh, but, you know, there are some synergies there that uh, in many instances can be good for the patients if those types of relationships really work well. The Affordable Care Act's made a lot of a tremendous impact on the delivery of health care nationwide and some see it for ill, some see it for good. When you focus on Virginia, what are the, what are the challenges going forward that, that you see in, uh, I guess, in complying with Affordable Care Act or from the perspective in some in taking advantage of some of the federal funding that might be available. What's, what's 2016 looking like as you uh, look around the corner? You wanna I'll go here? first. Okay. Uh, so th I think you have to parse, there are many pieces to this, okay? There were two big pieces uh, on the insurance side or the coverage side. Uh, one of those was obviously the uh, exchanges uh, Virginia very wisely chose to not adopt its own exchange. It had a federally facilitated exchange. Uh, I know a little bit about some of the states that went all in and did everything. It's exceedingly costly. We spent hundreds of millions of dollars as a country with no accountability. Oregon couldn't enroll anybody. Maryland spent hundreds of millions. Maryland's uh, 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 Massachusetts crashed theirs, and they had the original idea of an exchange. They, they couldn't make it go with the one the feds had. So that piece of it will get uh, sorted out and Virginia did enroll several hundred thousand folks through the exchange this year, all through your IRS now involved in your health care. Um, the other piece is Medicaid expansion. Uh, we looked at that. We have chosen as a state to not do that. Uh, I personally think that's the right decision for where we are. We're going to get our Medicaid reforecasting this year. We're going to be 800 million or a billion up without expansion. And when you talk to those states that have expanded, they, they have managed to enroll more people than they thought, but it has been at an extraordinary cost. And so I think our process of going forward with trying to make Medicaid as efficient as we can uh, and use the dollars that we have uh, probably makes more sense for Virginia. There are other pieces of this. We actually have a uh, three or four million dollar what we call a SIM grant. This is a grant which is for innovation. This is a grant where we can get new programs and new ideas for how to deliver health care more effectively. And I think we'll see that roll out. They're competing for another grant to see if we can get some structural changes with things like these accountable care organizations or accountable care communities where you use your health care system schooled up with your localities to try to deliver the care to the folks that are the high cost folks. Yeah, I think uh, just picking up on what Delegate O'Bannon uh, said there, uh, we have benefited, I think, tremendously from the health insurance exchange. And I agree with uh, the delegate in terms of how the process that we went through that of having a partnership, you know, with the federal government implementing this, uh, I think that has worked well. We uh, far exceeded the projections uh, this year in terms of the number of people that would sign up. And so we have a lot of people who have private health insurance coverage who previously did not. Uh, it's well over 300,000, I think, uh, now that have that coverage. So that has really helped a lot and has actually brought down somewhat uh, the percent of the population in Virginia that's uninsured. Uh, the, clearly, the big piece right now is for those who are below 138% of poverty uh, who would qualify if we did a Medicaid expansion or some other something similar to that. We need to figure out how we're going to take care of those people, and we've not resolved that issue yet. I think that we have a very well-run Medicaid program. It's consistently rated one of the best in the entire country. I think we've addressed a lot of issues over the last few years to 
uh, make it even better than it was previously. We now have a partnership with the federal government where we're taking people who have both Medicare and Medicaid benefits, improving the quality of care and making it less expensive. So we're doing a lot of the right things. And what we need to do is to find a, a way to be able to get coverage to those people. It makes a difference in how he their health status, how healthy they are. It makes a difference in their life expectancy. And I think it can benefit us in Virginia in terms of our economy, in terms of our, uh, the overall savings to the, to the state, uh, in terms of things we're spending money on now that we would not have to do if we had something to be able to provide coverage to these people. And we just had to figure out how we're going to get there. We did pass a, uh, a measure in the Senate uh, not this year in 2015, but in 2014 that uh, Senator Watkins had uh, proposed to sort of have a privatized version uh, of it. Uh, and certainly I'm willing to work with anybody who, who will work with us and sort of figure out how we do it. it is, I'm not so worried about how we do it. We need to do it as best we can. It's, but we need to figure out a way to get it done. We started off by talking about the Joint Commission on Health Care. Let's, let's, let's come back to it in our closing few minutes. Um, there are issues that you all are wrestling with that are different from the ones we've just been discussing. Uh, I know that uh, we're going to put up the website that people can go to the Joint Commission site and they can see the times of your October meeting, your November meeting. They can see any of the subgroups uh, that have their meetings. And then they'll see in November that then you'll be trying to, at that point, make some policy decisions about what you'll be recommending. So. I understand that while you're the chair and you're one other member that the entire commission will be deciding. But having said that, what are some of the issues that you think are likely to come out of the joint commission that you'll be, as an entire General Assembly, addressing in 2016? Well, there, there's, there are several issues that, that we're looking at. And uh, just at the meeting uh, that we had this morning, uh, we talked about uh, a couple of things. One was what you can do to people who have chronic diseases and need help in managing those chronic diseases and help in resolving problems, uh, what you do with people who need transition from, you know, from intensive care to be able to help themselves go back into the community and take care of themselves. There are programs that can help a lot of these people better manage their own health status and therefore need less uh, intervention and care. And so it actually produces savings, but we need to figure out how we're going to uh, take on those. Another thing we talked about today was uh, trauma-informed care. Uh, a lot of children, a high percentage, of, much higher percentage of children, I think most anyone would expect, are affected by things that happen in their lives when they're children and, and young adolescents. And it's sort of making sure that we understand what's happening and how we can help those people. So we're moving forward in a lot of those types of things. And actually one other thing that we're working with, and also the Virginia Health Workforce Authority is, is working on as well, is how can we increase the number of medical residencies in Virginia? We've doubled the number of medical schools from three to six just in mm. the last few years, but we have almost no increase in the number of residency slots. So people go through and get trained in Virginia, get educated in Virginia, but then when they need the training into their residency program, they go out of state. Guess what? They don't come back. So we're, we're investing in their education, but not uh, helping us in the long run. So we, we're, those are some of the types of issues that we're dealing with. Mr. Chairman, what are some others? Well, I think I would reinforce what George said about when you talk about uh, workforce and, and uh, I heard the figure there are 25,000 people, physicians, who have graduated from medical school and have no residencies. Residency wow. slots were frozen, I guess, about budget amendment or whatever in the late 90s. Right. So we've not had any increase in residency slots, mm -hmm. and yet we're pumping out uh, practitioners. So that's, that's the box that we're in on that. Another big thing I think we have needed to deal with was uh, behavioral health and mental health issues. And we go back to 07, we go back to Senator Deeds, he's now chairing the commission, and that's an ongoing commission, and, and we still have this thing that happened in Roanoke in the TV station. Right. So I, I really think we, uh, and we, we actually addressed this last year with a good bipartisan uh, program where we took the gap people for the seriously met, uh, mentally ill folks and got up to 20,000 of those folks where they could get some basic care, get their meds, mm -hmm. make sure they uh, have ongoing longitudinal treatment, which will be helpful. We're blessed in Virginia. We have uh, not only what's called FQHCs, the Federal Health Centers, but we have about 60 free clinics. These are true, people in Maryland don't know what a free clinic is mm -hmm. because they don't exist. So we have made use of the free clinic system uh, in Virginia for a lot of our care for the gap folks that are in the middle. 
I want to thank both of you very much for being on This Week in Richmond. We look forward to having you back to talk more on health care. But thank you both. Hi, welcome. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. For jobs, the economy, and public health, Virginia Hospitals, our lifeline. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.